Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalam. Al Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma baad. Auzu billahi min shaitani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna dina in the Lail Islam. Rabbi Shali Sadri. Wa Silli Amri. Wa Halul Ugdata Mil Lesani Yafka Kauli. The respected scholars and speakers from different parts of the world, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of this last session and the last lecture of this 10 day international Islamic conference is peace the solution for humanity or is Islam the solution for humanity Islam is derived from the root word salam or salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting a will to Almighty God. So the topic of today's lecture is, is Peace acquired by submitting a will to Almighty God, the solution for humanity. Islam, unlike other religions and other ways of life, which only cater either to the physical needs of the body or the spiritual aspect, most of the religions they mainly cater to the spiritual aspects and the needs of the soul. And some isms, like materialism, etc., as well as communism, they mainly cater to the physical needs of the body. Islam, alhamdulillah, it caters to both the spiritual need of the soul as well as the physical need of the body. It has a dual role. And as far as the solution to humanity is concerned, the glorious Quran is the most positive book in the world. It is a proclamation to humanity. It is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It is a warning to the heedless. It's a guide to the erring. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering and it is a hope to those in despair. This glorious Quran has the solution to the problems of humanity. Now, whenever anyone gives you a solution, you would like to know the source. You'd like to know the authenticity. For example, if you're sick and if someone gives a prescription, you'd like to know that who has written the prescription. Is it a doctor? What are his qualifications? Similarly, people would like to know that who is the author of this glorious Quran? People like to know what is the authenticity of this glorious Quran? But natural, I cannot give the solution for humanity. I am zero in Islam. The best person to give the solution for humanity is the creator of humanity. It is the creator of humankind. It is the creator of the world. It is the creator of the universe. The best solution for the problems of humanity can be given by the sustainer, by the cherisher of the humankind, of the whole world as well as the whole universe. So before we dwell into the topic, 
I would first like to spend a few moments or a few minutes telling the audience the authenticity of this book and the source of this book. At the start of this conference on the seven day, about eight days back last Saturday, I had given a talk, is the Quran God's word? But I feel I may have to report, I may have to repeat a very small portion in a nutshell because now I feel that there are multiple times more audience than last Saturday, multiple times. Last Saturday was a huge gathering. Now I feel the gathering is much more huge and I'm sorry that many people are standing. It looks much more than the Juma gathering we had two days back. So that's the reason I will repeat a small portion of my talk just for a few minutes. I'll try and prove in a nutshell that the glorious Quran is the word of Almighty God as well as those people who do not believe in Almighty God, I will try to prove to them the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God. When an atheist comes and approaches me, and when he tells me that I do not believe in a God, the first thing I do is I congratulate him. People may wonder, why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I'm congratulating an atheist is because he is thinking. Most of the human beings, they do blind belief. He's a Christian because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu because father is Hindu. Some Muslims, they're Muslim because their father are Muslim. This atheist, he is thinking. He may be coming from a religious background, but he, he does not agree that the God, his parents are worshipping, that they can be such a God. So he disagrees in the existence of God. And the reason I congratulate him is because <clears throat> he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, the first part of the Islamic creed that is La Ilaha, that there is no God. The only thing I have to do now is to prove to him Allah, Illallah, but Allah, which I shall do inshallah. Here, half my job is done. To the other non-Muslims, first, I have to prove to them that the God they are worshipping is not a true God. Here, half my job is done. He has already agreed that there is no God. So only thing I have to prove to him is the existence of the true Almighty God. That is Illallah, which I shall do inshallah. Most of the atheists, they think that science is ultimate. Nowadays, this is the age of science and technology, and they feel that science is ultimate. And if you ask any atheist, that suppose there is an equipment, there is a gadget, which no one in the world has ever seen, no one has heard of. And if that gadget is bought in front of this atheist, and the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this gadget, the mechanism of this equipment? The atheist will reply that it will be the creator. Some may say the manufacturer, some may say the maker, some may say the inventor, some may say the producer. Whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar. Either it will be the creator, the manufacturer, the maker, it will be the inventor, it will be somewhat similar. Don't grapple with the words, just keep that answer at the back of your mind. Ask him the question that how did our universe come into existence? He will tell you that initially there was a primary nebula. Later on there was a secondary separation, there was a big bang which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the sun, the planets, and the earth on which we live. This, they call it as the Big Bang. When we ask the atheists that when did you come to know about this creation of the universe, the Big Bang? 
So he will tell you, we came to know recently, 30 years back, 40 years back. I tell him that this information about the creation of the universe is mentioned in this book, the glorious Quran, 1400 years ago in a nutshell. It's mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Avalam yaral lazina kafaru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. That the heaven and the earth, they were joined together and we clove them asunder. This big bang, what you're talking about, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? They will tell you, maybe it's a flock. Don't argue with him. Continue. What is the shape of this earth? So he will tell you that previously the human beings thought that the earth on which we live is flat. It was in 1579 when Sir Francis Drake, he sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. What you came to know in 1579 is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30. Where it's mentioned, and thereafter we have made the earth egg shaped. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And we know that the earth on which we live is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole and bulging from the center. It is geospherical in shape. And the Arabic word dahaha does not refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, it too is geospherical in shape. Who could have mentioned 1400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical? The atheist may say, maybe your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was an intelligent person. Don't argue. Continue. The light of the moon, is it its own light or is it a reflected light? So the atheist will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently in science, 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back, we came to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected light. Quran mentioned in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. Blessed is he who has made the constellation in the sky and placed therein sun having its own light and moon having a reflection of light, having borrowed light. The Arabic word used for sun is shams. It's always described as siraj or wahaj, meaning a torch or a blazing lamp. The Arabic word used in the Quran for moon is kamar. Its light is always described as munir or nur, meaning borrowed light or a reflection of light. Nowhere does the Quran refer to the moonlight as its own light. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? The atheist, maybe after a long pause he will say, maybe your prophet, he was extra intelligent. Don't argue, continue. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982. I had learned in the subject of science and geography that the sun, though it revolved, it did not rotate about its own axis. The SS will ask, is this mentioned in the Quran? I will tell you, no, no, this is what I learned in school. More than 25 years back, this is what I learned in school. But when I read the verse of the Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, it says, it's Allah who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yes, bohun describes the motion of a moving body, indicating that the sun, besides revolving, it is also rotating about its own axis. And today science tells us that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. 
who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago, which science has discovered recently, just a couple of decades earlier. When I was in school, I didn't know about this. Now, all the textbook, they say very clearly that the sun, besides revolving, even rotates about its whole axis. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? And most probably, the atheist, he'll be silent. Don't wait for the reply, continue. Today, science tells us that our universe is expanding, which we discovered recently, a couple of hundred years back. Quran mentions in Surah Dariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47, that we have created the expanding universe, the vastness of space. The Arabic Musiona, the Arabic word Musiona, it means the expanding universe, the vastness of space. There may be many critics of Islam who will say, it is nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy since the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. And I do agree with them, that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. But I'd like to remind them, it was centuries after the Quran was revealed that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it's from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the field of hydrology, when we asked the atheist that when did we come to know about the water cycle? So he will tell you that Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 was the first person who described the present water cycle. How does the water evaporate from the ocean? It forms into clouds, moves into the interior, it falls on a rain, and the water cycle is replenished. This water cycle is mentioned in the Quran in great detail 1400 years ago. The Quran mentions too that the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, the clouds join, then move into the interior, then the water falls down, and the water table is replenished. The Quran speaks about hydrology and the water cycle in great detail in several verses. In Surah Azumur, chapter 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 57. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 40 and 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40. As well as Surah Jashia, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. In Surah Waqa, chapter 56, verse number 60 to 70. In Surah Mulk, chapter 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq, chapter 86, verse number 11. You can quote, only keep on quoting the references, the Quran, speaks about the water cycle in great detail. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? Don't wait for the answer, continue. The Quran, it speaks about geology, that the mountains have got pegs which give stability to the earth. It's mentioned in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7. In the field of oceanology, we knew there were two types of water, salt and sweet, but the Quran goes ahead and says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, it is he who has let free two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, the other, it is salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. And today, we know that this barzakh, what the Quran speaks about today, those people who are experts in the subject of oceanology, they say this is called as an unseen barrier. The Quran, it speaks about biology. In Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30. We have created every living thing from water. Who could have believed in the deserts of Arabia 1400 years ago, where there is scarcity of water, that every living creature is made of water? But today, science has testified that. In the field of botany, the Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 53, that we have created the plants in pairs, male and female. Previously, we did not know that even the plants are created in male and female. 
Quran says in Surah Raw, chapter number 13, verse number 3, that we have created every kind of fruit in pairs. In the field of geology, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, that the birds and the animals live in community like the human beings which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bee in Surah Nahal, chapter 15, verse 60 and 69. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 41. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the ants in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, all of which we have come to know recently, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. In the field of medicine, the Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, that we give to the human beings a drink of varying colors coming from the belly of the bee in which there is healing for mankind. Today we have come to know recently that the honey is derived from the belly of the bee and in the honey it has got antiseptic properties. No wonder the Russians used honey to cover up the wounds. This we came to know recently. In the field of physiology, the Quran speaks about the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell in Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 66. In the field of genetics, the Quran says in Surah Najam chapter number 53 verse number 45, 46 as well as Surah Qiyamah chapter 75 verse number 37 and 39 that it is the male fluid, the sperm which is responsible for the sex of the child which we have come to know recently. The Quran speaks about embryology in great detail in Surah Alaq chapter 96 verse number 1 that we have created the human being from alaka that's the leech like substance something which clings it's also called as a congealed clot of blood the quran speaks about the various embryological stages in great detail which modern embryology has just discovered recently in surah mu'minun chapter 23 verse number 12 to 14. i'll just mention a couple of more normally the unbelievers they object that how can Almighty God, once we have died and we have been buried in the ground, in the dust, how will Almighty God be able to reassemble our bones after our bones have got disintegrated? On the day of judgment, how will we be able to reassemble the bones? And Almighty God says in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4, that He can not only reassemble the bones, he can even reassemble the very tips of the finger in perfect order. And it was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold discovered the fingerprinting method and said that no two fingerprints, even in a millions of human beings, even in millions of human beings together, no two fingerprints are identical. What the CIA, the police, the CIA, the FBI, today they use the fingerprinting method to identify the criminal. Allah mentioned 1400 years ago. He can not only re reassemble your bone, he can even reconstruct in perfect or the very tips of your finger. When we ask the atheist, that who would have mentioned this in the Quran? The only reply he can give you is, it is the creator, it is the manufacturer, it is the inventor, it is the maker, it is the producer. This creator, this manufacturer, this inventor, this maker, this producer, we Muslims, we call him as Allah. I have tried to summarize my two hours lecture of Saturday in only approximately 15 minutes so that we can have more time for question and session just for the benefit of the multiple times number of people that are here. According to Albert Einstein, he said that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Let me remind you, the glorious Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. It's a book of ayats. And in the glorious Quran, there are more than 6,000 signs, more than 6,000 ayats, out of which more than a thousand speak about signs. I'm not trying to take the help of signs 
to prove the authenticity of the Quran. For us Muslims, the Quran is a yardstick. But for the non-Muslims, for the atheist, for him, science is the yastik. So I'm taking his yastik and comparing with our yastik and trying to prove that what your yastik has mentioned yesterday, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, our yastik, the glorious Quran, has already mentioned 14 years ago. That's the reason today science is not eliminating God but it is eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. So this glorious Quran has the solution to the problems of humankind. And its author is the creator, the sustainer, the cherisher of the whole humankind, of the whole universe. Whole universe. There were several revelations sent by Almighty God on the face of the earth. But all the revelations that came before the last and final revelation, glorious Quran, were meant only for a particular group of people and it was meant to be followed only for a particular time period. But since the Quran was the last and final revelation of Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was sent for the whole of humankind. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, that Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a criteria for judgment from right to wrong and as a guidance for the whole of humankind. Not only for the Muslims or for the Arabs, for the whole of humankind. The same message is repeated in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse 52, as well as Surah Azumur, chapter 39, verse 41, that the Quran has been sent for the whole of humankind. Similarly, all the messengers that came before the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only sent for a particular group of people. And the message which they brought was meant to be followed only till a particular time period. But since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final revelation, he was not sent only for the Muslims or for the Arabs. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds. The same message is repeated. In Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا قَفَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَزِيرًا We have sent thee not but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings yet do not know. And because most of the human beings yet do not know, that's the reason we are having such conferences and such lectures. But today, if we read, if we hear, if we notice the international media, there is virulent propaganda about Islam in the international media. Whether it be the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the international TV channels, the international satellite channels, we find in the international media, they are spreading many misconceptions about Islam. There is virulent propaganda about Islam. And according to an article which came in the Newsweek, Newsweek magazine on 16th of April 1979, it says that in the span of 150 years, from 1800 to 1850, more than 60,000 books have been written against Islam. And if we calculate, if we divide the number of days and number of books written, more than one book was written against Islam every day. And after 9-11, that 11th of September 2001, this has reached epidemic level. Every day, Several books are written against Islam. If you want to get famous, 
if you write a book against Islam, the chances it will become a bestseller is high. And we notice that the international media, they use several strategies to spread these misconceptions about Islam. Number one is, they pick up the black sheep of the community and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. There are black sheep in every community. So what the media does, they pick up the black sheep amongst the Muslims. They are not actually practicing Muslims. They are namesake Muslims. They pick them up and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. If you want to know how good is the car, and if you put behind the steering wheel a person who does not know how to drive the car, and if he has an accident, if he bangs the car, who will you blame? Will you blame the car or the driver? Who will you blame? The car or the driver? But naturally the driver. If you want to know how good the car is, you have to analyze the specification. What is the fuel consumption of the car? What is the speed? What is the gear ratio? What are the safety measures? After analyzing these, then can you judge how good the car is. And if you want to really test drive the car, put behind the steering wheel a person who is an expert driver. And if you want to judge Islam, how good Islam is, and you really want to analyze an exemplary Muslim, the best example, it is our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at his seerah. Analyze the history of the Prophet and undoubtedly, you'll have to agree that this religion and the follower of this religion, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the major benefactor for the spreading of peace. Second strategy used is many a times they give quotations of the Quran and the religious scriptures of Islam out of context. And we find that many critics, if you read many of the books against Islam, if you go on the internet, many sites against Islam, and they give references from the Quran as well as the quotation. And one quotation which is very often used by the critics is of Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5. And this was also used by Arun Shori, one of the staunchest critics of Islam in this country, India. His name is Arun Shuri. And he writes in his book, The World of Fatwa, and he gives the reference that Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, and it tells the Muslims, that wherever you find the kafir, into brackets is indicating Hindus. He's saying that the Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, that wherever you find the kafir, you have to kill them. And if you read the Quran, if you open the Quran and if you read the translation, what he's saying is correct. Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5 does say that wherever you find the kafir, you kill them. But it is quoted out of context. For context, you have to start from verse number one of Surah Tawbah, chapter 9. And when you read the context and know the background, why was this verse revealed? We come to know that there was a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah. So when this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of Makkah, Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says in Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse number 5, that He is giving four months time. Otherwise, there is a declaration of war. And it's mentioned in Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse number 5, that after the four problem months, It is the Muslims that 
you fight and you kill the pagans that means your enemies wherever you find them and wait for them seize them and wait for them in every stratagem of war so in context we come to know this verse was revealed in the battlefield that in the battlefield when the peace treaty is broken and when the enemies come to fight you don't get scared fight back and kill them where you find them but natural any army general in the battlefield to boost up the morale of the soldier he will say fight them suppose there's a war going on between us and vietnam and if the army general of usa if he says that wherever you find the vietnamese you kill them but naturally it's in context but if i quote out of context and say that today the army general of america says that wherever you find a vietnamese today you kill them i will make him sound like a butcher but naturally to boost up the morale almighty god will not say that okay run away to boost up the morale he has to say that don't get scared fight and it's a fight between truth and falsehood and such examples you'll find in the bible if you see in the gospel the gospel of matthew you'll find in the in the hindu scriptures in bhagavad gita full bhagavad gita speaks about that that lord krishna he is giving advice to arjun arjun in the battlefield he says in bhagavad gita chapter number 1 verse no 46 47 48 in the battlefield he puts his weapon and says i would prefer being killed unarmed than to fight my relatives so shri krishn says just a few verses later in bhagavad gita chapter number 2 verse number 2 and 3 that how oh arjun how can you be so important it is the duty of the kshatriya it is the duty of the warrior to fight and only if you fight will you go to the heavenly planet to the paradise and it goes on and on you can see my cassette on terrorism and jihad where i spoke in detail but when the quran speaks about this non muslims have a problem imagine if i say that bhagavad gita is saying kill your relatives it will be delvish and bhagavad gita does say that if i say bhagavad gita says kill your relatives it will be devilish in context it says that when you have to fight against antruth if you have to fight against oppression stand for truth even if it be against your relatives and as far as this message of bhagavad gita is concerned we are for it quran says the same therefore to make the non muslims understand islam according to me the master key given in the quran by our creator allah subhanahu wa taala is surah al imran chapter 3 verse 64 which says talu ila kalmatin sawa in bayna baynakum come to common terms as between us and you the best way to make the non muslims understand islam and quran is talu ila kalmatin sawa in bayna baynakum come to common terms as between us and you which is the first term allah na abda illa allah that we worship none but one almighty god allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and arun shuri after quoting verse number 5 of surah tauba he jumps to verse number 7 you know why verse number 6 has the answer to his sickness verse number 6 of surah tauba chapter number 9 says that if any of the pagans if any of the disbelievers if any of your enemies seek asylum if they want peace grant it to them so that they may hear the word of almighty god and escort them to a place of security because these are men who do not understand the quran does not say let them go today if the enemy wants peace maximum the army general say okay let them go quran does not say that quran says escort them to a place of security because these are men who do not understand just a few months back when i was giving 
a similar example. There's a non-Muslim from, from the audience who said, Brother Zakir, even you are quoting out of context. You haven't quoted the full verse of Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5. And he went also to say that the full verse reads, after saying that in the battlefield, wherever you find the kafir, kill them and slay them, wait for them in every strategy in war. It continues and says, but if they repent, and if they establish prayers, regular prayers, and regular charity, then let them go. For Allah is forgiving and merciful. So he's telling, we come to know that only if they accept Islam, do you have to leave them. See, many a time it becomes difficult for us to give the full explanation, other the lecture will be maybe 10 hours long. As it is, people say that I'm a marathon speaker. But I, I thanked that Hindu brother and said, Jazakallah for giving me an opportunity for clarifying more. Verse number 5 of Surah Toba does refer that if the unbeliever, if he repents and establish, establish regular prayer, establish regular prayer and give regular charity, indicating he becomes a Muslim, then let him go. But verse number six, what does it say? If he becomes a Muslim, let him go. But verse number six says that if the unbeliever seeks asylum, wants peace, don't just let him go. Escort him to a place of security. If he becomes a Muslim, let him go. But if he does not become a Muslim and wants peace, Don't just leave him, escort him to a place of security because maybe now he's, now he's in between, he's on the fence. Those who accept Islam find they're Muslims. He wants peace. Maybe the non-Muslims, they may kill him. Maybe the non-Muslim would like to take revenge. Why is he wanting for peace? So Almighty God says in the Quran, don't leave them. Escort them to a place of security. So that's the reason critics like Arun Shuri, they skip verses, they quote out of context, and you can have, you can give hundreds of such examples. If you go on the internet, it's very common, and we find now many of the non-Muslims, they go on the internet, and to speak again to the Quran has become easy, therefore more books are being published, very easy. You know, internet is a boon and a bane. Initially when it started, there were more websites against Islam than for Islam. Now Muslims have caught up, there are good sites also, but you don't have to be a scholar to find mistakes in the Quran, alleged mistakes in the Quran. And it's difficult to reply, the, the moment you keep on replying more and more keep on coming, that's the, time, that's the reason we have open question and answer sessions. So strategy number two is, they quote the verses of the Quran and the Islamic scriptures out of context. Third strategy is, They say things about Islam which are alien to Islam. It does not exist in Islam. For example, many critics say that Islam is an unscientific religion. Just to give you one example, time will not permit me to give several examples. Since nowadays we are having a controversy on the famous Bangladeshi writer, Taslima Nasri. She says that the Quran mentions that the sun revolves around the earth. And if we have to believe in such an outdated book, how can the Muslims advance? And I challenge anyone to point out any verse of the Quran which says that the sun revolves around the earth. And I said this several years back when I had a debate about her in the Bombay Union of Journalists. What she's referring to is the verse of the Quran which I quoted earlier in my talk in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, which says, Huwallazi khalaqa layl wa nahara. It is Allah who has created the night and the day. Wa shamsa wal kamar, the sun and the moon. Qullun fi falki has bohun. Each one traveling in its own orbit. Each one traveling in its own orbit. So here the Quran says that the sun is revolving in motion. 
Nowhere does the Quran say that the sun is revolving around the earth. It's her own understanding, her own interpretation. The word earth is not there in the verse of the Quran. The Quran says it revolves in a motion which I explained earlier. The Quran says besides revolving, it also rotates. When I was in school, I didn't know about that. And now science justified that. So many times, the critics of Islam, they say things about Islam which are alien to Islam. And very often, fourth strategy used. They mention things about Islam, and after that they say that because of this, Islam is the problem for humanity. Today the problem that you have in the world is mainly because of Islam. And they say, Muslims are terrorists. They are fundamentalists. They are extremists. Islam is an intolerant religion. Because of all these things, Islam is a problem for humanity. And many a times, we Muslims are apologetic, which I would rather use the strategy of turn the tables over. And today, Muslims are called as fundamentalists. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? Fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular field. For example, if a person wants to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. For a person to be a good scientist, he should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. For example, if we have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, he is bad for the society. He is a bane for the society. On the other hand, if we have a fundamentalist doctor who saves hundreds of human lives, he is a boon for the society. You can't paint all fundamentals with the same brush that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field is the person a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I am concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. Because I know, I strive and I follow the principles of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam, not a single teaching of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be a few teachings of Islam which some non-Muslim may feel is against humanity. But the moment you give the logical reasoning, the statistics behind the teaching, there is not a single human being who is unbiased who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. And this word fundamentalism was first coined according to the Webster Dictionary. It was used to describe the Protestant Christians in the early part of the 20th century in America. So this word first was used for the Americans, for the Protestant Christians because they protested against the church. The church believed that the message of the Bible was from God. These protestant Christians, they protested that not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every letter, every word of the Bible is from God, this fundamentalism movement, it's a good movement. On the other hand, if someone can prove that every word of the Bible is not from Almighty God, then this movement is not a good movement. 
when we read the Oxford Dictionary, we find out, and it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion. But when I read one of the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, there was a side change. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion, especially Islam. So especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary. The moment you see a Muslim, your mind goes that he's a fundamentalist. And we Muslims are apologetic. I'm not a fundamentalist. I say I'm a fundamentalist. What's the problem? You cannot be a good Muslim until you are a fundamentalist Muslim. The media says Muslims are extremist. I say yes, I'm an extremist. I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely loving, I'm extremely merciful, I'm extremely honest, I'm extremely just. What's wrong in being extremely kind, extremely merciful, extremely loving, extremely just, extremely honest? You can't be partly honest. When it benefits you, you're honest. When it does not benefit you, you aren't honest. According to the Quran, you have to be extremely kind, extremely merciful. If you are a Muslim, you have to be an extremist Muslim. You have to be extremely kind. You have to be extremely honest. You have to be extremely just. I want a single human being to tell me what is wrong in being extremely honest. You have to be extremist in the right direction. We Muslims should not be apologetic. No, no, no. I'm a moderate Muslim. What is a moderate Muslim? Do you follow Islam or don't follow Islam? Allah says in the Quran that enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 98. You can't say I want to follow part of Islam. You have to be fully just. You have to be fully honest. Extremely honest. Today, Muslims are given the label that Muslims are terrorists. I say, in context, every Muslim, he should be a terrorist. What is the meaning of the word terrorist? Terrorist by definition means a person who causes terror. Whenever a criminal sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the criminal, the policeman is a terrorist. In this context, in this context, every Muslim should be a terrorist to the criminal. Whenever any criminal sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any robber sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any rapist sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. If every Muslim are truly terrorist in the right way, terrorizing the criminals, then you will have the solution for humanity. If every human being is a fundamentalist Muslim, following the fundamentals of Islam, the problems of humanity will be solved. If every human being is an extremist Muslim, extremely kind, extremely loving, extremely honest, extremely just, the problems of humanity will be solved. Many a times, two different labels are given to the same individual for the same activity. For example, 60 years back, 70 years back, there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. When the British were ruling India, these Indians, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But the same people, for the same activity, we common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, then you have to call these Indians as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you'll call these people as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. And we find such examples, several such examples in history, several. 
we know during the American Revolution in 1875, when the Britishers, when they occupied America, there were many Americans who were fighting for the freedom. And number one terrorist, according to the British government, was George Washington. George Washington by the British government was called as number one terrorist in 1875. Later on, he becomes the president of America, USA. Imagine, terrorist number one becomes the president of USA. And he happens to be the godfather of all the presidents to come, including George Bush. And what are my comments on George Bush? You can see my tape, Terrorism and Jihad, and Islamic Perspective. And we find several such examples. Before free South Africa, before South Africa was free, it was ruled by the white apartheid government. This white apartheid government had imprinted Nelson Mandela for more than 25 years in Robben Islands. And they said that he was terrorist number one. Later on, after the apartheid government was revealed, was removed in South Africa, when the new government came, they released Nelson Mandela and later on he got the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine terrorist number one getting Nobel Prize for Peace. Not that he was bad and then he became good. Not that he was, he killed many people and then he became good. For the same activity for which he was called terrorist number one, he was given the Nobel Prize for Peace. So what we come to know today, it's in the hands of the media. Whoever is in power, Whatever label they give to a person, it gets stuck. Whether it's the truth or not, that is secondary. Whoever is in power, who has control of the media, what they portray about a person, that label gets stuck to that person. Therefore, before giving a label, first you have to identify for what reason that person was striving, and then give the label. And Quran clearly mentions in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder, or for creating corruption in the land, or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Most of the religions say that killing innocent human being is wrong. Quran goes a step further and says that if you kill any innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And it does not stop there. It goes further and says that if you save any human life, it is as though you have saved the whole of humankind. I, being a student of comparative religion, I have not come across any such verse in any religious scripture besides the Quran. Most of the religious scriptures do say you should not kill innocent human being. Quran goes a step further and says that if you kill any innocent human being, you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you have saved any human being, you have saved the whole of humanity. Yet, Islam is called as an intolerant religion. And I do say that Islam is an intolerant religion. Islam is intolerant towards corruption. Islam is intolerant towards injustice. Islam is intolerant towards discrimination. Islam is intolerant towards dishonesty. Islam is intolerant towards racism. Islam is intolerant towards victimization. It is an intolerant religion. Theoretically, all the countries say that dishonesty is wrong. All the countries and all the religions, they say corruption is wrong. All of the people, they say discrimination is wrong. They say racism is wrong. They say victimization is wrong. But that is only a theory in most of the countries. Most of the countries have corruption. There's dishonesty in most of the countries. So just because Islam is intolerant towards the practices, which are prevalent in many countries, I do agree Islam is an intolerant religion. Islam is intolerant towards those things which Almighty God thinks is wrong for the human being, which today 
Many human beings feel it is a part and parcel of society. They think if you do these things, you are advanced. So Islam is intolerant to those things which the creator feels is wrong and many of the human beings today feel is right. Islam is intolerant towards alcoholism. Islam is intolerant towards drug addiction, towards pornography, towards prostitution, towards adultery, towards fornication. Islam is an intolerant religion. It's intolerant towards the evils of the society. Because if you're intolerant towards these things, then only will you have the solution to the problems of humanity. Many people go on the defense. Oh, Islam is not an intolerant religion. It is intolerant towards the vices. But tolerant towards the things which are good. It does not force anyone at the point of the sword. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 256, like Rafi Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Many people quote this and put a full stop. That's not the end of the verse. The verse continues. Like Rafi Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. You have to present the truth. If you want to accept it, accept it. If you don't want to accept it, no problem. No one can force you to accept Islam at the point of the sword or the point of the gun. In this way, it is the most tolerant religion. When we analyze most of the religions, they speak good things. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference between Islam and the other religions is that Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve that state of goodness. For example, most of the religions say that you should not rob. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. So what is the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam, besides saying that you should not rob, it shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not rob. Islam has a system of zakat. One of the pillars of Islam is zakat, that every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that wealth every lunar year in charity to the poor people. If every rich human being gives charity, gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. Yet, even after no human being will die of hunger, yet there are people who yet want to rob to get wealth easily, to fulfill the desires which are wrong. Islam has a solution for that also. After zakat, Almighty God says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, as to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Non-Muslims will say, chopping off the hands? In this 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. And they think that every second person you come across in Saudi Arabia, where this law is practiced, you will find that every second person will have his hand chopped off. I have been to Saudi Arabia several times, more than 20, 30 times. Never have I come across a single human being whose hands have been chopped off. Surely there will be some people whose hands may have been chopped off, but the law is so strict, a person will think a million times before robbing. Not that the police of Saudi Arabia are very intelligent, that they're very good, but the law is so strict that the moment you implement the law, you get results. The moment you make the law easy, if this law is relaxed in Saudi Arabia, robbery will start in Saudi Arabia also. And today, we look up to America as a country which is most advanced. Do you know it is the country which has one of the highest rate of theft and robbery? 
I'm asking you the question that if you, if you implement the Islamic Sharia in America and USA, that every rich person who has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold should give 2.5% of his excess wealth in charity. And after that, if any person robs, chop off his or her hand, I'm asking you the question, will the rate of theft and robbery in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. It is not a very intelligent question that you have answered. It is simple logic. You implement the Sharia and you get results. So Islam is the only solution to the problems of humankind. Let me give you one more example. Most of the religions, they say, that it should not molest a woman, that it should not rape a woman. Hinduism says that, Christianity says that, Islam says the same. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam, besides saying that it should not molest a woman, that it should not rape a woman, it shows you a way in which you can achieve a society in which there will be no molestation, there will not be any rape. Islam speaks about the system of hijab. Most of the people talk about the hijab for the woman. But Almighty God in the Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, Say to the believing man that whenever he looks at a woman, if any brazen thought comes, any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his gaze. There was a Muslim person, Muslim man, who was staring at a girl for a long time. I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's not allowed in Islam. So he told me, our beloved prophet said that the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited. I have not completed my first glance. What did the prophet mean that the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited? That does not mean you can look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying, I have not completed my glance. What the prophet meant that unintentionally, if you look at a woman, do not look at her again to feast on her beauty. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Almighty God says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31. That says, that say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what appears ordinarily of and draw her head covering over a bosom and display not a beauty except in front of a father, a brother, a husband and a big list of maram, the close relatives which you cannot marry is given. In short, there are six criteria for hijab mentioned in the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad The first is the extent. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear. It should not be tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through the clothes. The fourth, the clothes should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And the Quran says, In Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59. O Prophet, tell your wives, your daughters, and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the jilbab, they should put on the overcoat, over cloak, so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. The Quran says hijab had been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized and it, that they shall be recognized as modest and it will prevent them from being molested. I would like to ask a simple question. That, suppose there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful. And one of them, she is wearing the Western clothes, mini skirts or shorts. And the other twin sister, she is wearing the Islamic hijab. 
complete body covered except the face and hands up to the rest. And if they're walking down the streets of Bombay, maybe at Pedder Road or Napinsi Road, there were many bird watchers. If they're walking down the streets of Pedder Road or Napinsi Road, and if round the corner there is a hooligan who's waiting for a catch, who's going to tease a girl, I'm asking the question, which girl will he tease? Will he tease the girl wearing the mini skirts or shorts? Or will he tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab? Which girl will he tease? But naturally, the girl wearing the mini skirt. So Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized that they're modest and it will prevent them from being molested. After that, the Islamic Sharia says, any man rapes any woman, he gets capital punishment, death penalty. Many non muslims will say, death penalty? In this age of science and technology, in the 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. But when you ask this question, and I've asked this question to thousands of non-Muslims, that God forbid, suppose someone rapes your mother, or someone rapes your sister, and if you are made the judge, and if the rapist is brought in front of you, what punishment will you give to that rapist? And believe me, 100%, 100% of the non-Muslims, they said, we will put him to death. Some went to the extreme of saying, we will torture him to death. There was only one smart Alex when I went to USA. He told me, the brother Zakir, I will give him five years imprisonment. I said, fine. Then I told him that according to the statistics of America, out of those people who are convicted for rape and they are given imprisonment when they come out 95% rape again so if you want a rape if you want your mother to be raped again you're most welcome we Muslims don't want that so he told me if that's the case then I would give him death penalty as the first shot Today, America, we look up to America as the most advanced country in the world. Do you know it is a country which has one of the highest rate of rape? According to the statistics of the FBI government in 1990 alone, every day, 1,756 rapes took place. According to the statistics of 2003, it says in the U.S. Department of Criminal Justice, again repeated in 1996, it says that every day, on average, 2,713 cases of rape took place in America. That means every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place in America. We are here for one and a half hour. Already more than 100 rape may have taken place in America since the time we are here. I am asking you the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that any man looks at a woman, if any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. After that, every woman, she should be modestly dressed, complete body covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. And after that, if any man rapes a woman, he gets capital punishment, death penalty. I'm asking the question, will the rate of rape in America, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? It will decrease. Easy question, easy answer. You don't have to be a scholar to know this. You implement the Sharia, and you get results. But because Islam gives the solution, it does not go down the throat. But a few years ago, the Home Minister of India, L.K. Adwani, he had said in the parliament, and he proposed that in India also, there should be death penalty for the rapist. And I congratulate him for that. I may not agree with his other policies, but as far as this policy is concerned, I agree with him that death penalty for the rapist. Maybe the next Home Minister will say that every woman in India should have the hijab on, inshallah. If you want no rape to take place in India, anywhere in the world, whether it be America, UK, you implement the Sharia, you'll get the results immediately. That's the reason the least rate of rape in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. Any country which implements the Islamic Sharia, Whatever part they implement, they get results. Whatever part they don't implement, they don't get results. Today we find 
the journal of Islam, the religion of Islam, it is said to be a religion which degrades the woman, which subjugates the woman. For the complete answer, you can refer to my video cassette, Women's Rights in Islam. Time does not permit me to speak in detail. But if we analyze today, the Western society claiming to uplift, claiming to uplift the woman is actually they are degrading the woman. The Western talk of women's liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of deprivation of honor, degrading a soul as well as exploitation of a body. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to a status of concubine, mistresses and society butterflies which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. In the name of art and culture and women's liberalization, what is the Western world doing? They are selling our daughters, they are selling our mothers, they are selling our sisters. And India, after a few years, what the Western country does, we find India is following that. Follow the good things, I've got no problem. You know, when I was in school, more than 20 years back, most of the newspaper, they were clean. You could hardly find any obscene photographs. But now, if you pick up any newspaper, whether leading newspaper, daily newspaper, most of them, almost all, they have to have obscene photographs in it. Even on the sports page, what do they have? Football star, then they show the girlfriend. So what has the girlfriend want to do with football? They want to sell the paper. Women's liberalization. Ronald, do you know what the name? I don't know all the names of the football stars. And then they say the girlfriend. Then you find a cricketer. And then you find the girlfriend. So even on the sports page, if there's no news of women, then they show the girlfriend. Invariably, all the newspapers and many newspapers have supplements. Supplements. Like Times of India, the most famous newspaper. It's the largest selling English newspaper of the world. Largest selling daily newspaper of the world. It has a supplement called Bombay Times. And people of Bombay know what is Bombay Times famous for. Especially page number three. And this was a strategy. And I do agree. After getting this strategy, the sale of Times of India has increased. I'm not against Times of India only. I'm, telling, I'm talking about Times of India because that's the paper I read daily. You talk about any other newspaper, DNA, Hindu, uh, Hindustan Times, Indian Times, up or down, less or more, you'll find these women with, who are swimming, who are semi-nude. In the name of women's liberalization. So I used to tell my vendor, I'm a newspaper man, that don't only give me Times of India. I don't want Bombay Times. He's saying, Sabi, free, hai, free. Move off me. I said, if you give me Bombay Times, I won't pay you money. He's telling me, free, hai, free. Don't worry, sir, it is free. I said, I don't want it. Only give me the main newspaper. That I mentioned a few years back. But today, even in the main newspaper, you have women. Either on the sports page, either on international news, either on the front page. Somewhere there you'll find, no wonder the selling of most of the newspapers have increased. And we find in the name of women liberalization, in the name of art and culture. In ads you'll find, most of the ads have got women. If you see an ad of a motorcycle, whether it be abroad or whether it be in India, how many women ride motorcycle? How many? Percentage is less than 1%. In India, less than 1% abroad also. But invariably, in a motorcycle ad, you'll find a woman. For what? And I was told about the very famous BMW ad. You know, BMW ad is very famous. The BMW car, the car which has a status is Mercedes. But for the youngsters, the BMW is famous. It has a good pickup, it's a faster car. So someone told me that one of the ads of BMW, it had a girl in a bikini in front of the car. And, and the caption was, test drive her now. Who, the girl or the car? 
What are we doing? Are you selling your daughters, your mothers, your sisters? Islam does not believe in such kind of liberalization. If you say this is liberalization, we are happy with what we are. We love our sisters, we love our mothers, we love our wives. We love them, we respect them, and we want to protect them. And we give them equal rights. For more details about rights of women in Islam, refer to my video cassette, Women's Rights in Islam. I would like to end my talk by trying to clarify the last misconception that Islam was spread by the sword. If you translate, peace was spread by the sword. Peace was spread by the sword. And you have noticed that in the exhibition, in the panels, we had certain common misnomers. Common misnomers like the world is flat. You have a square triangle. Two plus two is equal to five. Islamic terrorism is the same. How the world is not flat, it's a common misnomer. Two plus two is not equal to four. 2 plus 2 not equal to 5. Similarly, Islam and terrorism, it is exactly the opposite. But it's a very common misconception. And the reply was given very well by Delefi O'Leary, a very famous historian, in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8. And he says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword, is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. It is the most absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. And we know from history that we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. We did not force anyone at the point of the sword, neither did we do our message, we didn't convey the message. Later on, the Crusaders came, they wiped off the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the Azan. If we wanted, we could have forced everyone to accept Islam as the point of the sword, but we didn't do it. We Muslims, the Arabs, we have been the lord of the Arab lands for the past 1400 years. For a few years, the Britishers came, for a few years, the French came, but overall, we have been the lord of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. Yet today, there are more than 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means the Christian since generation. These 14 million Arab Coptic Christians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was in spirit of the point of the sword. We Muslims, we ruled this great country, India, for about a thousand years, the Mughals. If we wanted, we could have forced every Indian to accept Islam at the point of the sword. But we didn't do it. Today, more than 80% Indians, they are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was in spirit of the point of the sword. Today, the country which has the largest population of Muslims in Indonesia, which army went to Indonesia? Which army went to Malaysia, which has more than 50% Muslims? Which army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? It is the sword of the intellect. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 25, Udu ila sabili rabbika bhalikma, wal mu'azit al-hasna, wajadin billati ahasan. Invite all to the way of their Lord with the wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best most gracious. It is the sword of the intellect which is conquering the hearts. It's not the sword of steel. It is the sword of reasoning and understanding which is winning over people. According to an article which came in the Plain Truth magazine, which was repeated in the Reader's Digest Almanic Yearbook 1984-1986, it gave the statistics of the increase in the major world religion in a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984. And number one religion which increased the maximum was Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I'm asking the question, which war took place in the span of 50 years 
from 1934 to 1984, which forced millions of human beings to millions of human beings to accept Islam. Which war? Which sword? It's a sort of intellect, sort of reasoning. Today, according to statistics, the fastest growing religion in America and USA is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I'm asking you the question, who is forcing these Americans to accept Islam? Who is forcing the Europeans to accept Islam? And when the media says that Islam is subjugating the women, do you know, out of those people who are accepting Islam in the world, about two-thirds, more than 65%, they are women. More than 65% who are accepting Islam in America, they are women. More than 65% who are accepting Islam in Europe, they are women. I am asking you the question, if Islam subjugates the women, then why are the American women accepting Islam? Why are the European women accepting Islam? Why are the European women accepting Islam? Why are the Indian women accepting Islam? Why? Because Islam has the solution for the problem of womankind. They have seen the world. When they see the world, they find that Islam is the only solution for the problems of womankind. And today we find, as I mentioned earlier, that there is virulent propaganda about Islam. On the media, we find that they are spreading misconception. But the more they're doing that, we find 9-11, after 9-11, this has reached epidemic levels. Writings against Islam, misconception about Islam, the propaganda against Islam increased. But I believe in the verse of the Quran of Sulaim Iran. Chapter number three, verse number 54, where Allah says, Makrum makrallah, wallahu khairul makreen. That they planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best plan. Allah is the best of planners. After 9 11, the amount of propaganda they're doing against Islam, do you know, after 9 11, the spread of Islam has increased only in a span of 10 months in USA alone. After 9-11, more than 34,000 Americans accepted Islam. In Europe alone, more than 22,000 accepted Islam in 10 months' time after 9-11. And I go to Europe, I go to UK very often, I go to America, and I find that after 9-11, when I give talks, there are more Americans coming for my talk. There are more Europeans coming for my talk. It's good. They want to know what kind of religion is this. Some come to attack, some come to learn. We welcome both of them. We welcome both of them. I like people who attack with reasoning. I love them. And we know how that Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, was one of the staunchest enemies of Islam. And the Prophet paid for his hidayah, he got hidayah. Then he became one of the staunchest supporters of Islam. That is the reason when Muslim youngsters say that death to George Bush, I said, don't say death to George Bush, say give, may Allah give that to George Bush. And we find that the more they're attacking Islam, the more Islam is spreading. After 9-11, the crowd is increasing, even here. And we find even in Bombay, non-Muslims are coming. Previously, we used to give chance to anyone to ask a question. Since the last few years, in my talks, non-Muslim first preference. But the Muslims complain that they never get a chance. And even today, inshallah, the first chance will be non-Muslim only, inshallah. Allah gives the promise in the glorious Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Fatah, chapter 48, verse number 28. As well as in Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse number 9. Huwa allazi arsala rasulahu biluda wa dhin al-haq liyu zira wa laddhin kulli. Allah has sent His Messenger with truth, with wisdom and religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other isms. However much the disbelievers don't like it. And enough is Allah as a witness. This deen, this religion of peace, submitting of will to Almighty God, is 
the only solution for the problems of humankind. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran from Sulaiman Imran, chapter number three, verse number nineteen, which says, "In the Dina, in the Lail Islam, Allah, the Creator, in the last and final revelation, says that in the Dina, in the Lail Islam, the only way of life, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is peace." Acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. Wa akhir dawan. Alhamdulillahirabbilalamin.